Hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I am Asma Shindi. I am a petroleum engineer graduated from American University of Ras Al Khaimah. On behalf of Pio Petro, Arab Oil and Gas Academy and SPE Egypt section, I would like to welcome all of you to the third session of our short course, Cement Evaluation, The Basics and Beyond, presented by distinguished speaker, Mr. Kirk Harris. Our course is four webinars and four quizzes and a final exam. Certificates are provided if you have scored higher than 70% of the total grade. Before I present our speaker, I would like to remind you, if you have any questions, please drop them in the Q&A box and use the chat box in a professional way to answer Mr. Kirk's questions. Now our speaker is Mr. Kirk Harris. He is the technical advisor for Throbone LLC, which provides technical support for cementing and bond log interpretation. Prior to his work, of Throbon, Kirk was the global cementing advisor for Occidental Petroleum, Talisman Energy, and Repsol. He began his career at Halliburton, where he worked as cementer, operation, and research engineer and technology manager. He has been the regional cementing advisor for Asia Pacific, the North Sea, Europe, Africa, the Permian Basin, and the Gulf of Mexico. Kirk graduated, uh, graduated from Purdue University with a bachelor's degree in, in a civil engineering. Today, our session will be on advanced bond log interpretation. So please pay, pay attention and welcome Mr. Kirk Harris. Mr. Harris, the mic is yours. Uh, thank you so much. It's a privilege to be here today to talk about advanced bond log interpretation. We will be doing a quick review, very, very quick, of our first two sessions. That review should last about three minutes or so. It'll be a quick review. And then we're going to talk about advanced bond log interpretation, whatever that is. Do you know I'm going to talk about a number of logging tools, or you'll see a number of logging tools. We could spend one hour just introducing one logging tool. We could spend a day learning how, to, how that tool works and how to interpret that tool. So we could spend days and months on this topic, and I still don't even know for sure what it means by advanced bond log interpretation. And I hope to explain that to you because many log interpreters have different ways and using different tools to interpret. I want to start though by reviewing the simplicity of the way that we interpret bond logs. That's why I kind of hate the word advanced. And as I do, I'll be asking you questions. I can see the chat feature. So please, let's have a discussion for the next hour to hour and 15 minutes. Let's have a discussion about how we interpret logs accurately. At the end of the day, that's what we want to do, advanced or basic. We want an accurate interpretation of the cement that's behind the pipe between the casing and the hole. We do that at Thoroughbond by a very simple method that we call the five C's. And while I consider this the basics, when we go into each part of the five C's, it becomes fairly advanced. But let's go through the basics. For those of you who have attended before one, uh, the, the first and second webinar, and I assume that you have, can you tell me what the five C's are? Can you tell me what the five steps of the method that we use to interpret? Does anyone know what the first C of the five is? Okay. Thank you. Oh boy, that makes me feel good. Thank you, Amr and Queen and Alia. Appreciate it. It's to construct. And what we will do, thank you, Joseph. We construct the well. We're going to look at this a little more in depth than we did for the last couple of weeks. We're going to look at the well bore. 
we're going to look at how we cemented the well, what formations, what casing, all of the parts of the well, and we're going to build that well before we start really looking at the log or while we look at the log. Then we're going to compare log sections. When we compare, we look up and down. And as we look up and down the log and we focus, as we'll see today especially, we'll focus not on this amplitude curve, and we'll review these curves, but we're going to focus on the variable density log over here. And as we look up and down, we will compare this section to this section. We then will correlate and we'll look side to side. Why did the change occur? We will then consider. And when we consider, we will be thinking, excuse me, when we consider, we'll be thinking what can be going on in the well bore that may be affecting our log. And then we'll conclude with how this cement job actually ended up. So the five C's, oops, we construct the well bore, we compare sections of the log where it's bad or good here in ultrasonic log, we correlate at the points of change where it goes from good to bad, we draw a line and we now look right to left and we see it correlates to a gamma spike. We then consider the well bore effects. Last week, we looked at one joint of casing that was new and had mill varnish. That's the white section in there, would not bond. Unless you consider new casing as part of your interpretation, you will not interpret this log correctly. You'll think the cement is absent when in fact it's just poorly bonded because of mill varnish around the casing. We then conclude, and last week we concluded a very uh, set of famous set of logs in my world, and that is where we conclude by noticing that gamma spike was a high-pressure dolomite that would cross-flow and wipe out our cement job. That brings me to some questions. That's the basics, and I'm going to start asking you a little quiz here. This isn't the official quiz or the official exam you'll be given, but see if you can answer these questions. Because now we're going to think advanced. Because I just told you we're going to construct the well, we're going to look up and down, side to side, think about how the well bore might affect the log, and conclude. Some would say that that's pretty basic, Harris. That's not advanced. So let's get into some advanced stuff. What is the point of evanescence? Does anybody have an answer for that? I'll only give you one sip of coffee to answer that question, because if you don't know it immediately, it'll take a long time to look up. No answers yet, and that's okay. But you're going to see certain logs that talk about the point of evanescence. I've been interpreting logs for almost 40 years. I'd never heard of it. And it's okay. The point of evanescence is the point of the sound wave. And we'll talk about sound waves a lot today. It's the point where the sound wave vanishes or disappears. Or is dampened so much that it no longer exists. Isn't that kind of neat? Now, why would someone come up with a term to put on a log saying, hey, I'm going to show you the point of evanescence. Here we see it. This is in a acoustic impedance versus flexural attenuation. The point at which we've dampened the wave, attenuated it so much that it goes away. Can't dampen it any further when it's totally dampened is the point of evanescence. But if you don't know that, it's going to confuse you. And here's the problem and what we'll talk about a lot today. This is very important as you learn a subject such as bond log interpretation. And that is many of the inputs from logging companies, uh, physicists, 
the, the sound wave experts at the universities, they're going to speak in terms that are very theoretical, that are very confusing. Confusing enough to make you say, I really just, I'll let someone else do the interpretation. I'll tell you right now, do not be scared of these big words or these confusing words that you haven't heard of. You can learn about them. You can learn how important they are or how maybe they were just made up to confuse you. Boy, we're already getting a little controversial here, and that's okay. Here's some other terms. Anybody want to take a shot at these four terms? We have something developed not long ago called multivariable threshold processing methods, MVTP. Do you like that term? Someone made it up. Someone with a big company makes it up. I mean, it makes sense. You're going to use more than one variable to process a log. But MVTP gets thrown around. You say, I know nothing about MVTP, and so you move away. The same is true for an SLG curve, which is just stands for solid liquid gas. Or ACE processing, been done for years, a very simple process, but it can confuse you. And then bond index, which is much more popular. Here's what I want you to do with these terms and these thoughts when it comes to interpreting the log. If you want to learn them, that's fine. You may run across them if you keep practicing, and that is something you want to do. Keep practicing at these logs. But here's what I do with these types of names and ways to log. I ignore them. Especially, we're going to look at bond index. And bond index is very important because you see it so much. I'm going to get back to simplicity to talk about advanced. I'm going to talk about a sound wave. We're going to learn very quickly as I ask some more questions that everything we're talking about is about the sound wave. Now, there are ways that have been developed that do not involve sound to measure cement behind pipe. For example, we can run porosity logs to see what the near wellbore porosity is, as an example. But we're talking in advanced bond log interpretation, we're talking about sound waves. Here's another question, question two. I'll be talking about casing or formation or ring. I usually talk about casing ring. You saw the bell there before. What is ring? When it comes to ringing a bell or when it comes to hitting a sound wave against the casing and making that casing ring. If you go down hole and you listen, you're not going to hear a bell down there. So it's a different kind of ring. Okay. Okay. Mary M says supply, like the supply of sound wave, I would assume. Amr, think of resonance. That's an interesting one. Appreciate those. I like Jamo's answer, but I, I like the other two answers too. Any other thoughts? Jamal, you can't see all of these answers, so let me... Uh, if on the chat feature, you've, you have the opportunity to choose in the drop down all panelists and attendees, then everyone can see your answer. But Miriam says supply. Amr says resonance. Jamal says casing signal. When I think of ring and we think of the sound wave, just for what we're going to be talking about. I think of the first few peaks of the sound wave. I think of those first few peaks, the loud sound when I ring a bell, that first loud sound, although it will resonate and other things will happen to that sound, it'll reflect and resonate that first boom. I think of his ring. 
although it continues to ring as it resonates. I also, when I look at that sound wave and think of the ring, I think also of the reflection. These are things that the sound waves will do. The sound wave will ring. As it goes out, it will reflect off of things. And imagine if I have a transmitter over here sending out a sound wave and a receiver over here, as it travels and reflects off something, I can pick it up over here a little bit later. The same sound wave only reflected, and I see that reflection a little further in that full sound wave. Also, let's look at it a little differently. Instead of having a transmitter and a receiver, maybe the transmitter goes straight out and echoes back and I start getting a resonance. The sound wave isn't traveling away and I hear it. It didn't reflect, not just reflection, but it's also a vibration that's occurring. Question three. What is attenuation? So going back to ring, we get the casing signal or the amplitude. We get a reflection, which may be a formation arrival, not a casing arrival. But we also, in certain modes, can get a vibration or a resonance occurring. Thank you, Miriam. Waves get lower amplitude or waves start dampening, or the weakening of sound, Amr, great, the weakening of, of sound until it disappears. And when it disappears, that is the point of evanescence. You can now forget evanescence. Now that you've heard it and remembered it, you can forget it. Attenuation is, as that sound wave, that amplitude gets smaller. When it gets smaller, not a direct correlation, but it's getting quieter, not as loud. It's being dampened. We'll talk about attenuation quite a bit today. Here are some logging tools. We're going to cover some of these. We've already covered the bond log and the ultrasonic log. We'll review those today. We're going to talk about the compensated bond log. Very interesting and more advanced. We'll talk about the segmented bond log which is a Baker tool. We'll talk about the shear wave attenuation, just barely, which is also a Baker tool. And then we'll not talk about, but there is several other logging tool technologies, including one that I'm working with right now, which is the multiple string isolation log. I'm working with a few different technologies and different logs. This is, we, again, we could talk months about these logging tools. But let's again, bring it back to something simple. What do all of these tools have in common? Think about ultrasonic logs. Think about regular bond logs. Think about radio logs where we have several receivers and we'll, we'll touch on these, but what are four things all bond logging tools have in common? What do all logging tools, thank you, Amr, it all deals with waves. They all have ring. Let's call it ring signals. Thank you, Queen. Excellent. They all have ring. What else do they have? They have a transmitter and a receiver. That's good, too. Those transmitters and receivers, they pick things up because all logging tools are dealing with the reflection of waves. We're shooting them somewhere, and then we're listening for the echo or the reflection as it travels down various medium. Number three, they're all relative And we'll make a bit of a, a difference there when we talk about amplitude, but they're all comparing one wave to another, one signal to another. We'll look at that more 
and they all are affected by real well bores. We're no longer in the lab. Do you know what I think makes advanced interpretation? And I'll repeat this several times is it's advanced when you start understanding how the well bore, how the well bore is affecting your physics. We can come up with all sorts of theories and make it work perfectly in the lab. In the well bore, we have so many things trying to do things to the well bore, to the steel, to the formation, to the bonds, that it gets very difficult to trust your pure physics. And we'll talk more about that. This is the real well bore. The well bore, as we talk about, is made up of the formation very important, the effects of the formation. It's made up of the cement, the casing, and the logging fluid, and the connections or the bonds between each of these. I just put up here very quickly, you don't have to read the whole thing. We to often talk about the problem with logging tools and bond logging is that we have to go through mud, rock, and steel. And I just give a few examples here. Heavy mud in the well bore, starting at the top, dampens the sound. Heavy casing rings louder or is harder to dampen than lighter casing. If you have channels, they will cause ring. Lightweight cement causes ring. Washouts affect the log. Shale attenuates the ring. Oil wet casings become involved. Shrinking cement, fast formations, pressure tested casings, and down the list. This well bore is doing numbers on those sound waves, making them louder, making them reflect more, making them quieter. It's, and if you want, to go into advanced interpretation, you better know the well bore. So here's our guide, very simple, to interpretation. See, I, I go from basics to what I feel is advanced very quickly. Three simple points for interpretation. Number one, these are very important. Let the well bore interpret the log before you use the log to interpret the well bore. Let the well bore interpret the log. When you construct that well bore, lay it on the log and it will interpret the log quite often. Pretty interesting week this week. Met with a lot of people this week. A couple of new technology companies were working on new technologies. Uh, I interpreted a log for a very interesting situation, and I received the log, and a very big logging company had interpreted the log incorrectly. I don't think they interpreted it incorrectly. I know they did. There's no doubt in my mind. Because why did they misinterpret the log? And this was very important log. They didn't let the well bore interpret the log. So as we often see, they discounted all of the lightweight lead cement in their interpretation. They just threw it away, said there's no cement there. I said, well, of course there's cement there. Not only do I see it on the log, the cementing reports, we have to have. And once again, they were calling the top of cement where the top of the good cement was, when I say good cement, the tail cement, the strong cement, better than good. And all of the lightweight lead, they threw away. You can't do that. Let that well bore interpret the log. Let then the log interpret the log. We'll see that very clearly here. And finally, let the log interpret the well bore. Now we can finally get to the log interpreting the well bore, and I will show you that step as well. What we often do though, interpreters will just go to the log and say, log interpret the well bore. And what do you know about that well bore? Nothing. Do you want to take a look? Well, uh, if we have time, 
Well, it's critical that we take a look. Let that well bore first interpret the log before the log interprets the well bore. This is a picture in Arizona in the United States. My son lives out there. And he goes out and his favorite thing to do is to hunt animals. I mean, he goes and he shoots the animal and he eats the animal. I hope that doesn't offend anybody. As I say it, it doesn't offend me, but I don't do this. I don't, I don't have a gun. I don't like to shoot animals, but he does. So I don't like to be too judgmental on people. <laughs> so I hope this doesn't offend you. I'm not going to show you any animals, but I will show you as he goes out into the, to the trees here, what he's waiting for is the deer so that he can start tracking the deer so then he can eventually eat the deer. But he's looking out here and he can't see anything. He looks along the horizon up the mountain. He sees nothing. With him is an expert at hunting the deer. He is a guide. He's teaching him how to hunt the deer. And the guide always finds the deer. There it is. So here's my son now. And he couldn't see it. But the guide says, right down there where I have the red circle, that's where the deer is. And my son asked him, how, how come you always see the deer and I never see it? I look as hard as you look, but I can't see it. And the guide told him, oh, someday you will. When you look enough times, you'll start to know where to look, what to look for. You'll start seeing the deer. Be patient. Don't give up. And so they found the deer, they got the deer, I guess he ate the deer. The same is true when you go to the bond log. Here on the left is a bond log, kind of a bond log, it's a compensated log. On the right is the ultrasonic log. What do you see when you look at these logs? When you look at the log, you see lines and colors and graphs and tracks and and surely, if you've never seen a log, it's very confusing. And even when you've looked at the logs, you're not sure, where do I look on the log to see something? This is a quick guide. I don't give much explanation here. I will in just a bit. What I look for when I look at the log. Because when I look at the log, I want to see the well bore. That's what I want to see. So every one of these circles... It's something that relates to the well bore, not sound waves. And connecting sound waves to the well bore is something that you practice and practice and you start seeing because you know where to look. Here is what I look at. And this is just, again, we won't go through each one, but on point, for example, on point one right here. I'm showing a tail cement down here, a lead cement here. And so step one, I look to find the better bond, you constructing the well to find the top of tail cement. And then I use lead cement volumes to help me find the top of ultimate cement. But I look at that interface. I always go to look for the interface between a heavy tail cement and a lighter, weaker lead cement. I look all the way up and down, and these are the 20 things that I look for on a log, both bond log and ultrasonic. I'm not going through each one. It would take a long time to do that. But what I'm trying to explain to you is I look at the bond log, and I'm thinking well bore. I'm thinking well bore, and over experience and time, I've learned what certain well bore effects, how, what they have on the log. For example, I can look above casing collars and we see a lot of settling out of solids and other materials on casing collars. So I look above casing collars all the time. Normally we wouldn't think about that unless we're thinking about the well bore. Here's an example of the casing collars. I look at these all the time. To me, they are a key 
to not only determine what happened, but then to explain to a regulator or a boss or a client so that he understands. Here's part of a bond law gets at a collar. What do you think about this collar? Do we have cement there or not? Do we have good cement or not? We learned last week, and we're going to review the bond logs here in a second, but we, we learned last week at a casing collar, you get that flaring out, that chevron pattern, and you can see that chevron pattern right here. See it? This, this is where the two pieces of casing join together. Do I have cement here or not? I'll look at that casing collar. Do you think we have cement on this casing collar? Hard to say. I mean, hey, it's a 50-50 guess at this point. Do you think we have cement in that casing collar or not? Amr says, no, doesn't look good, which I agree it doesn't look good. Straight line chevron patterns. Let me ask you this, Amr. See if I can change your mind. Do I have cement? This is on the same log. Do I have cement at this casing collar? Now I have really straight lines and really a chevron pattern. Look at this. That's going back to the original one I just showed you. Do you see how it dampens? No cement. Beautiful, beautiful casing collars, shining, going all the way out from one end to the next. Look how it's dampened. This is what lead cement looks like around casing collars. And we watch for that. Here's some other casing collars. They get truncated, not just dampened. Down below, that truncation or that cutting off of the collar, we have cement there as well. And so we look for those kind of observations. Look what else we can learn from collars. There's an obvious collar that you can see on the VDL. I've got it circled. Do you see that? Obvious. It lines up with our casing collar locator. Here's one that's not so obvious. See it? It's occurring in between. Matter of fact, I can see another one here. I can see another one up here. These are the casing collars of the previous casing that we can pick up, which helped to show us that I probably have, am cemented between the two here I now have a dampened collar, and now I'm also connected to the other casing by cement. So we learn things from casing collars. We learn things from all 20 of the points, and there are actually 35 things that I look at on a log. But we often see these on the log. Here's something else we see. Something totally, I'm just pulling it out. This is advanced. But when I look at certain logs, I can, I've looked at enough where I see what I call cement signatures. Here, I'm getting kind of a shearing of the casing arrival, but these strong arrivals, I see this. This is a lightweight but strong cement where I get a very strong front and everything else kind of shears out. This is a hollow sphere cement. And Jama, I'll come back and answer your question in just a bit. This is a silica flower cement where I get very hazy shearing. And I see that again and again and again. These are from different locations, different places, but you get very similar signatures. And we start to look for cement signature. Jamal's asking, what corresponds to that dampening in red, that, that circle in red? Uh, we don't have the data for that. What I'm guessing is that it correlates to the casing collar of the casing outside this one. This happens to be a section of casing 
inside casing up above the previous casing shoe. And so what do I, am I reflecting off of? I go through the cement, hit the outside casing, and then I pick up that secondary collar, which gives me an indication. If I can see the secondary collar, maybe I've got cement back there. Thank you, Amr. Hollow sphere cements, we actually put hollow pozzolan or glass spheres in the cement to lighten it. Silica flour is just ground up sand. And we put that in cement, usually when the temperature is above 230F or 110C, to keep the cement from weakening because hot temperatures will make weaker bonds unless we put more silica in and increase the silica calcium ratio. So it's just materials that we put in. We see the same with latex cements. They have a signature. And so we, we look for signatures as part of an advanced method. So we let the well bore interpret the log. We also let the log interpret the log. What do you see here? I will tell you, first of all, this is nine and five eighths casing. All I'm showing you is the amplitude the free pipe amplitude for nine and five eighths casing is 52 millivolts. I don't show you the headers here, but trust me, what I'm showing you there is 52 millivolts. If I use amplitude and at Thurabon, we do not. We refer to amplitude, we do not use it. Most use amplitude who interpret. 52 millivolts. I'm going to let this log interpret itself, though. If I take this as an absolute value, this is my absolute value. It's free pipe amplitude. It must be free pipe. And what's down below there must be cement. What if I showed you the same log but went a little higher and start comparing the log to itself? Will that change your mind where top of cement is? Now I get a uniform, and something interesting may be happening here, but for sure, I've got free pipe based on amplitude alone. I'm much more likely to have free pipe at the top, even though my amplitude is higher than what would be occurring. Someone might say, well, that may be open air amplitude, and I could agree with that. We could look at this more deeply. But I'm going to let the log interpret the log. I'm going to compare sections of the log that gives me better clarity. Okay, here we go. Let's let you interpret some logs here. Interpret which is the better log, the one at the top or the one at the bottom. Amplitude curve is on the left. The higher the amplitude, the louder the sound, which means the less cement that's gathered around dampening that sound. So high amplitude is bad. We don't use amplitude in advanced interpretation, but there it is. Which is the better bond log? In this case, in this part of the world, question from Amr is the 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 I, I, the perturb perturbation. I never heard of that word before, Amr. But the changes on the amplitude at the collar. Why does that occur? is the question on the amplitude curve. Yeah, I, I don't, usually you don't see that kind of big spike in there, but obviously when you get to a gap, this is all about the gap that's occurring where they connect, you know, it gets dampened because you have 
it's not traveling all through that steel, but that's a funny looking one down at the bottom, but. Can you see which one looks the best? Look at the VDL. Which VDL looks different or better than the other VDL? Can you see that? Another part of advanced bond log interpretation, any interpretation, is observation. And if you look, you'll notice they're exactly the same. Exactly. Thank you, Omar. They are exactly the same. Why is one millivolt less than the other millivolt? This is a lesson you must learn about advanced bond log interpretation. It's not a fun lesson, but it's a true lesson. Why would the amplitude be different? The reason is, is because with the logging inputs, you can change the amplitude. You can actually change the VDL if you change threshold colors or values, but the VDL is the VDL. But the amplitude, I can just put a different acoustic impedance or cement strength into my inputs and shift it to where I want that amplitude to be. In other words, I may do it because I realistically think that's where it belongs, and I'm trying to correct the tool, or I can do it because I need 10 millivolts to pass. And I will tell you in this case, I know the company needed 10 millivolts to get a pass. The first log was the original log. I got to see it. The second, the one at the bottom, the one at the top was the processed log, where changes were made to shift the amplitude. That's why we use the VDL, and that's also why I want to let the log interpret the log because I'm not concerned if it's 10 or 19. I can shift that all around. I'm concerned how it compares up and down the well. Let's move quickly here. We then that let the log interpret the well bore. Here we have our well bore. We know the problem. We have gas bubbling to surface. I don't need a log to tell me I have gas bubbling to surface. Matter of fact, if the log says there is no channel, I'll say, I don't believe the log. I believe the well bore. But I'm now not trying to let, I've already let the well bore interpret the log. Now I'm trying to let the log interpret the well bore. I know it's gas. Where is it coming from? And here I pick up these flow channels. And now the log is telling me about the well bore. Well, the well bore can't tell me exactly where that channel is. The log does. And so the log is useful. Even though I promote the well bore in this interpretation process, I need the log. We let the log interpret the well bore. We looked at this one last week. What are the differences in the logging tools? The physics are different for some tools. The hardware is different, as we'll see. We have different transducers, different modes of making that, tra that sound wave travel from transmitter to receiver. Each tool has different limitations based upon the physics and hardware. The log outputs are different. We use different colors, different lines, put different names on them, as we'll see. And then the resolution is different, the detail. We see more detail in an ultrasonic log on a channel than we do, for example, from a radio log. Very quickly, let's go through about five logs. This is just a review. The CBL, we send a sound wave out. It's making an audible sound, 20 kilohertz. We're picking that sound as it goes in all directions at the three and five foot receiver. We get some information from the three foot receiver. We get the VDL from the five foot receiver. We send the sound wave out in all direction. The fastest wave usually goes down the casing to the receiver. And this is our bond log. 
Can you tell me what the curves are? There are five, if we want to talk about the tension, the, uh, the cable tension line, that's six. But number one is, number one, is the gamma ray. Thank you. Number two, not quite, is the transit time. Number three is the case and collar locator. Number four is that amplitude. Remember, we have kind of the running joke. It's not really a joke, but if you look at that amplitude more than five seconds, we make you slap yourself. So you'll stop looking at it and look over at the final curve, which is the, thank you, the variable density log. And thank you. There is an amplified amplitude, Jamal. You're correct in number four there. I skip over. And here you see the transition from tail cement to lead cement. This is a sample, very close sample of a log I interpreted this week where the big logging company said that wasn't lead cement. There was no cement. And they threw out about 80 barrels or 100 barrels of lead cement we had pumped. It looks pretty good to me. You got them. We got the gamma, the transit time, the case and collar locator, the amplitudes, including the amplified, just on a smaller scale, and the VDL. And we look for, when we interpret the VDL, we look for casing ring, formation signals, and fluid arrivals. The radio bond log is simply the bond log but then we have anywhere from six to eight to now 16 directional receivers that listen to one side of the casing and we get a cement map that tries to look around the casing to see a channel. We then have the ultrasonic log. This tool spins and as it spins, it picks up various shots and it's different because it goes and throws the sound wave out, catches it again, and is looking for not only the ring, and this ring is high pitched that you can't hear it, 200 to 700 kilohertz, but it also listens for the resonance, the vibration of the casing. It listens just not that first arrival and just not the resonance and it goes out all the way on it and it's different windows for the different manufacturers of the tools but it looks out for a window of resonance to calculate acoustic impedance and we looked at that and this is the log we get from that we can run it with a cbl I believe the best way to interpret logs is to have a CBL, a waveform, and a directional log, such as an ultrasonic or radio. And you get acoustic impedance, and we color dark colors for cement, blue colors for liquid, red colors for gas. With it, we can better see lightweight cements. Remember this, you might want to remember this for any future quizzes, <laughs> and that is uh, lightweight cements are difficult to, to log or to get a good log on because their bonding, their shear bond is low. It's low shear bond. Low shear bond, such as a lightweight cement, affects more logs than any. Low shear bond. It's guessed they affect 70 to 80% of all logs. And thank you, Jama. Excellent. Low and variable. This is the process part of the map. This is actually right here is that ACE processing gives you this scattering of material. It looks bad, but there is lead cement here. Lead debonded cement. That's when it gets difficult to see. That's when it's a tough one, but we can pick it up looks pretty bad. This one was also misinterpreted. 
And with the ultrasonic log, we see galaxy patterns as shown up above that tells us when the formation is very close to the casing. We can see clear, this is about a one to two inch channel, wide channel flowing up. You see some great things with the ultrasonic log. Finding channels is why we run that ultrasonic log on the right. Finding channels with the bond log, again, is something that you have to be, have to look at, have to know the area, have to understand the well bore. Look at the bond log here, not the, the ultrasonic, you can see the channels. You see these blue low side channels, probably mud that was not removed. You see after this centralizer and after this collar, you see maybe we're getting some turbines and we're getting cement there, but then the channel starts again. Look on the bond log. This is how you find channels on the bond log. Here we have good cement. Why do I get amplitude here and here? It's a channel. I know that because I compare it to the ultrasonic. And this gives you a, an indication quite often of when channeling occurs. When channeling occurs, you get brief spots of channeling and brief spots of good cement. Often that good cement occurs after a collar or a centralizer. If you have all one long bad channel, it's probably bonding, not channeling. They get abbreviated in the real well bore. Just something to think about when you're trying to determine, do I have channeling instead of poor bonding on a bond log when I don't have the help of the ultrasonic? We have the isolation scanner. We talked about that briefly. It's when we're shooting a flexural wave. This is a Schlumberger tool. I won't go into too much detail. On the, the bottom side here, we actually, as it spins, we're shooting an ultrasonic. We're doing an, a flexural attenuation. Again, think of the term relative. What we're measuring at two receivers, we shoot the wave, we bounce it off of our we reflect it. Here's our ring. Our ring's reflecting, and we're measuring the difference, or we're doing the relative difference between the first and second receiver to give us an flexural attenuation curve or map. And so we get a use it, but we also get the flexural attenuation. They process those two together and get something called the SLG plot, solid liquids gas. I said last week probably you will find that the SLG most often matches most often matches not that curve but the curve next to it here they just color it here because so often acoustic impedance flexural attenuation SLG acoustic impedance controls this technology controls the interpretation quite often. I now want to turn to, for the next 10, 15 minutes, and we'll close up in about 15, 20 minutes, the compensated cement bond log. Now we're going to get more advanced and more confusing. The compensated cement bond log. Why is it called compensated? I'm not even sure I know the answer to that, except what we're mainly doing with these types of logs. These logs have two transmitters and two receivers. Some have two transmitters and six receivers. I mean, they can get very complicated. But now we're going to shoot sound waves and hear them at two receivers, compare those, and now we're looking at the downhole sound wave. So we're compensating for the fluid effects, for the downhole temperature and pressure effects. We're not just shooting an amplitude and go, wow, I wonder how the wellbore fluid and pressure and temperature is affecting that amplitude. Here, I'm measuring the amplitude between two, and so I'm compensating for those downhole effects. So I shoot a sound wave from T1, and I pick it up at R2 and R3. I compare those amplitudes. 
right after that, I shoot a sound wave from T4 and I measure it back this, the other way. So not only is it compensated in the sense for down ho, it's compensated in the sense I get an average and a more accurate tool. And what, what am I trying to figure out here? Although I'm measuring amplitude, now remember how I feel about amplitude, the slap and all that stuff. But now I'm going to use that amplitude to calculate attenuation. I'm even going to go a next another step, which we're going to have to cover, and I'm going to go from attenuation to bond index, and then I'm really complicating the situation. Here is a compensated cement bond log, at least one type. This is a Schlumberger tool. It's a multi-mode array sonic tool, a mast tool. And I just want to point out, what you're seeing here is an amplitude, but it's a synthetic amplitude calculated from attenuation. So sometimes you're not seeing what you think you're seeing when you look at a bond log. And then we have the VDL, and that is what you're seeing. Let me give you another example. Here's a compensated bond log. I actually put this up on LinkedIn recently, and I was hoping someone, I don't know why I think that, you know why I go to LinkedIn sometimes? Just to look at something that's interesting. I don't want to think a lot. I just want to look. And sometimes I'll put something on LinkedIn and I ask people to really think. And I can just imagine someone going, would you just shut up and quit asking us questions on LinkedIn, please? But I did put this on LinkedIn and I say, can you name these 11, these 11 curves, which is on the compensated bond log? Can you name any of them? Do your best because on LinkedIn, when I posted this, Got a lot of hits, a lot of likes, all of that good stuff. No one guessed at any of them. <laughs> so, and I don't think I would have either, but I'm asking you now to do that. Do you know what any of these curves are? Do you know what B is? <laughs> Amr, you are right. Amr went right for the video. I love it. Thank you, Miriam. Yes, it is the gamma ray. What about, I'm going to trick you a little bit here. What about G? What's G? Thank you, Amr, for putting the question mark behind your answer. <laughs> Uh, Amr has said amplitude. It looks like amplitude. That's where the amplitude belongs. But thank you for putting the question mark behind amplitude because it's not amplitude. On the compensated bond logs, you may get a synthetic amplitude in some of them, but often you won't get an amplitude at all. What G actually is, is bond index. And so quickly going through these curves, here's what we have. A is the logging fluid transit time. It's the mud transit time. B is the gamma ray. Thank you. C is the transit time and D is the transit time. They should match. One is from the top transmitter to a receiver. The other is the bottom transmitter to a receiver. You can't see E very well. I, I noticed the hash mark. It's right on the line. E is the CCL. F, we usually see that. That's the tension. G is the bond index. H is a straight line that goes straight up and down. It is the, the bond index level. Or in other words, it tells you to the left of it is good bond, to the right is bad bond. And guess what? We can put that curve here. It's at 0.6. It's usually at 0.8. It goes from zero to one. You can put it wherever you want to make a good bond or bad bond. This is amazing how we go from amplitudes, measuring amplitudes, to shifting around and showing where you can show good bond or bad bond. 
I is the attenuation of the near receiver. J is the discriminated attenuation. That's what we're using to draw the bond index. We're comparing that, and I'll talk about bond index in a second. And then K is the variable density log. Many people will look at this log and think they're reading amplitude. And that's how confusing it can get. And each logging company can come up with a new way as we try, and here's why we do this. Whoever I talk to out in the field, they say, just make it simple, Kirk. Just draw a straight line. Tell me what it is. Don't make me go through this advanced interpretation. And if you're going to go that simple with it, you will misinterpret logs. This log was misinterpreted. A key log, and it was misinterpreted. Let's go to the segment of bond tool, and then we'll talk about bond index. I think we can talk about bond index. We have a few minutes. Let me just quickly say, since we are talking about bond index, in case we don't get there, bond index, the way this curve is calculated, and you will see this on all sorts of logs, be it amplitude logs or compensated logs, you will find bond index. What they do, based upon the attenuation curve J, they find the best bond that you have, the best attenuation that you have or that you think you should have. And let's say that that attenuation, it's in decibels per foot. Let's say that number is 10. That's the best. They will equate that 10 as the best. Any point beyond it that is less than 10 or even greater than 10, I guess, but at any point, I'll put that as the numerator and divide it by the 10. So if I've got 10 here, but I've only got nine here, we're going from zero here to zero to 10 decibels per foot, then my bond index is 0.9. Here, maybe it's 0.8. And I plot it over here, 0 0.9, 0 0.8. It's a little complex what I'm telling you, but all it is is my bond at any point in attenuation divided by my best bond. So it's all relative. And then I can draw the line wherever I want. Usually it's at point 0.8. Here it's at point 0.6. I hope that's not too confusing. We'll, we'll, we'll end up here with the segmented bond tool. This is a Baker tool. So I'm not going to show you too much about it. But what it does, the pads come out. This is the big feature to remember. Here are the pads. The pads have the transmitters and receivers on them, and they go and touch the casing. And then they send the sound out, and they pick it up from one re past one receiver and then another receiver. So one transmitter hits two receivers onto the next pads. That transmitter sends back and hits the other receivers. It's in a compensated tool. And then based upon their distance apart, attenuation is calculated. And so the segmented bond tool, here's what you get out of the log. You get the gamma. You get transit times. Again, there are two of them here from one transmitter past two receivers. Only now it's not going up and down the well. It's going around the well with pads all the way out to the casing. We get the transit times. We get the attenuation for each pad. Each pad has a receiver on it. Each pad has a transmitter on it. I had a diagram of that up there, but it's kind of a Baker diagram. I didn't really want to use it. And probably I should have, because when that transmitter goes, it hits two receivers, and then there's a transmitter, and then it shoots it back. It's the way the pads are aligned. So I get an attenuation for each pad. I get the max, and actually that should be average, not min. And then I get a cement map based upon the attenuation. And then I get the VDL. So it is an attenuation log. We need an entire hour on the SBT, the segmented bond tool, because it's used so much. And it's such an accurate tool, in my opinion, but it is based upon, 
as we go back, what's it based upon? Amplitude. So it's very sensitive to that bond. It has to be a strong bond. And remember, again, the number one cause of misinterpreted logs or confusing logs is low shear bond. And this is quite dependent upon that shear bond. True or false? There's a good question as we get into advanced. And we'll be uh, just concluding here in the next five minutes. Let me answer Jamo's question. He asked a question. Can we understand that compensated log does not contain the amplitude? Yes, I will say yes, you can understand that. Remember the one log I showed you, right? The mast tool, it has a synthetic amplitude based upon, Put it. you get the attenuation, you come back and you put the amplitude on. So you have to read the headers and the legends to see what you're showing. It'll show you on the log. So if you see something like amplitude or synthetic amplitude, it's calculated from the attenuation curve. They just put it, put it back into the formula. But normally, not, because often you'll see a synthetic amplitude. Uh, the original CBT tools, the, the cement bond tools by Schlumberger, you wouldn't see the amplitude. You're just going to see the attenuation curves and the bond index. Look at the header, it'll tell you. Good question, Jamal. What do we think about this question? Can we answer this? Although traditional cement evaluation technologies can provide some value information, they only respond to compressive strength. Interesting question. This statement was made by a big logging company. Is it true? Thank you, Dovran. Can you, can you, uh, he's saying, you, you're saying, I said false. Can you leave me alone? No, I can't leave you alone. Can you tell me why you think it's false? What else might it respond to? Okay, Amr. Good comment, Amr. I mean, I appreciate that. Thank you. Exactly. Good job, Dobbin. Appreciate that. Good bond. It's also shear bond is very important. Shear bond is related to compressive strength, but not all the time. I can have great compressive strength and low shear bond. So that's true in all tools. But there is a tool which is a shear wave attenuation tool. It's new, fairly new. It is a pad tool as well, where the pads touch the casing. And now we're looking at lamb waves, sound waves, and, and the particle movements in a shear plane. So they're looking for shear waves, not that go out through the cement, but that travel along the cement casing interface. Now, this tool is important if that previous statement was true, which is compressive strength is everything, but with the other traditional tools, but the other traditional tools are heavily dependent on shear bond as well, as Dovern has said. Here's an example of that log. This is a shear attenuation log. You'll see this as a new tool. A lot of people starting to run it. I wish everybody luck. I think it is a good tool, good principles, but you still have to interpret it knowing the well bore. What we have here, if I can explain, we have the VDL, and thank goodness, all of these tools, we can run the VDL and see some very clear, classic kind of images. But this colored map is now the shear bond map. And look, even though I can see clearly lead cement from tail cement, I know what these cements are. I understand how the well bore is connected. The shear bond still misses it and says there's no cement. Starts picking it up down here, and it misses all of the lead. 
I, I will warn you again as we close, and I'm anxious to answer some questions. I wish I could spend a whole day with you guys. And I can tell. I'm, I'm watching your stuff here. You're connected. And I, I want you to keep, keep after these logs. But by showing this, I want you to understand that a lot of things that you see or hear, so much is re regarded to shear bonds. So much is regarding what the well bore is doing. Even the most sophisticated logs, we need strong bond. We need shear bond or we, we get affected. Let me close by saying this. We try to keep interpretation simple. When I look at a log, I try to keep it simple. I, one reason is I, I don't understand, and I work with a lot of physicists. I, I, I don't understand. They're really smart people. And wave theory and wave physics are complex. They're complex. Uh, every time I sit down and we go over new technologies with physicists and how they cooperate and how they work with the real well bore, I leave with a headache. They're especially complex, though, in a real cased whole well bore. I'm working with a company now, and everything we do in the lab looks perfect. In the real well bore, we see different things, and it, it gets much more complex in the real well bore. Therefore, the best interpreters, in my humble opinion, the best interpreters when they interpret the log are the people who know the well bore and apply the well bore. Kind of an aside and related to that, related to physics, related to the well bore. Believe some things, some things that you learn at the university, some things that I tell you, some things that you read in books. Believe some things, but test everything. You will be taught things that are true in the lab that don't flesh out in the field. You will be told some things because someone heard from someone who heard from someone who was wrong. You will hear that it's truth by the time it gets to you because we kept passing on things before we tested them. Let's go back to the case in point, new casing. Does new casing bond better or worse than old rusty casing? Well, old rusty casing bonds better. But you may not hear that, or if someone told you there is no difference between the two, then you need to test it. And you will find when you test it that we like to see rusty old casing when it comes to cement bond. And finally, to be an expert, you must practice and play all the time. I watched the, uh, I don't watch too many sports anymore, but I watched the Masters Golf Tournament this weekend. These experts in golf never stop practicing and they play. They practice and they put that practice uh, into the game. The same is true with any expertise, bond logs notwithstanding. You need to look at bond logs. You need to test what you know, you need to understand as much as you can about the situation. What happened on the cement job? What happened on the well? What does the bond log look like? You got to practice at this. We talk about a lot of things with interpretation, but until you get in and see things and test them, then they stick, then you understand them. So I encourage you to keep looking at them. Keep educating yourself, but put that education into practice as much as you can. With that, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your participation and for your attendance. Thank you, Mr. Harris. It was a great session. You have already answered all the questions that came from the participants, but Amr still has a couple of questions. Uh, so the first question, um, can there be a localized pore bonding? If so, how to differentiate it from channeling? Yes, repeat the question, please. Can there be a localized pore bonding? If so, how, did it, how to differentiate it from channeling? 
Yes, I heard the poor bonding. I didn't hear the word before the poor bonding. How is that word spelled? Alkali I'm sorry. Localized. L O C A L I S E D. Localized. Okay, localized. Localized. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now repeat the question with localized in there. Okay. Can there be a localized poor bonding? If so, how to different differentiate it from a channeling? Okay. Great. No, it's a great question because wh what I said and what I'm saying to you when I say that is, is not a law or a rule. It's just a general thought that I look at. You can understand I have to have really poor bonding where it's bonding if the entire string is poorly bonded. I see When I see that, I think I've got a bonding issue. If it's a localized bonding issue, and I see it, it may happen at the casing collar, but it will go from collar to collar. And I look, I look for that mainly, collar to collar or a few collars. Uh, localized poor bonding is rare. I showed you a picture of one where it was one joint that poorly bonded. I could have showed you another where we only sandblast certain casings. So with a change in the casing, or a change in the cement, yes, I can correlate. But other than that, localized debonding might occur because the formations are coming in and squeezing. So I get localized bonding that's better in some places than others. So there are some, that would be the number one reason I would get localized. So you can't just say, hey, it's a short section that's poorly bonded. It's got to be a channel. It could be localized debonding. It's not as uh, straightforward and simple as I sometimes wish it were. But the more you look at them and the more you understand the well bore, where I have centralization, where I do not centralizers, then you'll get a good question. Okay, next question. Why the rusty, irregular surface of the casing make a better bond than the smooth surface? Yeah, it's, it, it's the same reason I, I have more friction. I can't move my hand up anymore because I'm locked in versus. So it's strictly the interlocking is one reason. The other reason is that we took bonds when I was in research one of the first things, one of the, one of the first projects I had was working with a special anti-corrosion cement. And when we would pump the cement, we would want to see how well it bonded because it was anti-corrosion, but it wouldn't bond very well. So we took it to the national laboratories in the United States and we broke the bond apart and we started looking at why is it bonded and why is it not? And we found when we did that, some might refute this. I was there looking at the bonds. But when you have rust, that the rust actually, the first hydration products, it actually anchors, the iron oxide anchors the cement better to the casing. It's actually a chemical reaction that occurs with the bond and rust. So that's another reason. Okay, that's all for today. Thank you, Engineer Harris, and thank you all. The session will be uploaded to Bio Petro YouTube channel and don't forget to solve the quiz on Google Classroom. Best of luck and thank you again. Thank you very much.